Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on this show, talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. Dean Flynn is a multi-genre photographer based in rural Northern California, who progressed from a role who progressed from roles as administrative who progressed from roles as an administrative assistant and educator to her true passion, landscape and still life photography. Known for her deep love of teaching, Nadine finds joy in helping others learn the art of photography, aiming to inspire her audience and guide them in creating their own fine art. Her work has been widely recognised with features in Click Magazine, Click and Mum's blog, Outdoor Photographer blog and the International Voice Photography Competition. Nadine's journey into photography began as a therapeutic response to personal loss and evolved through self-education and workshops. Today, she shares her love for capturing nature's beauty, highlighting how photography serves as a soothing medicinal activity for her. Nadine discusses her transition from hobbyist to part-time business owner, offering insights from memorable photography trips. In this episode, she also addresses the influence of AI on photography and the continuous learning required in the ever-evolving world of visual storytelling. She invites others to join her in chasing light, finding inspiration and capturing life's fleeting moments, offering a blend of technical expertise and heartfelt passion for photography. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi Nadine, welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? Hi Grant, I'm doing well, thanks. Thank you so much for having me. Pleased to have you on the show. It's been something that I've been looking forward to for a little bit of time. I've seen your work around the uh, the socials for quite some time, and you've definitely been on my target list. It's uh, it's a bit of a long list, so it's taking me a while to to get to everybody that I do want to talk to. But uh, I think I'll manage it eventually one day. Yeah, I'm pleased to be on that list. That's wonderful. Talking about being on the list, why are you a landscape photographer? What is it about photography that got you going right at the beginning? Oh my gosh. It's, I'll I'll try to make it a short story, but I uh, started uh, photography a few years ago, shortly after my sister passed away. She used to be the family photographer. And when she passed, I thought I need to get out the camera and document family events and things like that. And in the meantime, a mutual friend of ours invited me to a photography workshop that was being presented by Canon in her town. And so I agreed to go. And as it got closer, I thought, I can't show up with my little point and shoot camera. So I (laughs) borrowed a camera. And so I went to this workshop and the whole morning was explaining the exposure triangle and how to get a good exposure. And I just ate it up. I I was so interested in it. I had no idea there was this whole exposure triangle. And uh, in the afternoon, we went out to photograph on the coast. And uh, so that's really what got me interested. And when I got home, I just started looking for uh, all kinds of any training or any online classes that I could take to learn more about photography. And so initially I photographed everything yeah, and yeah. I came to the conclusion that what I really loved was landscape because it got me out in nature. Mm-hmm. It was very medicinal for me. And I have found over the years that many other people that enter into photography have chosen that as also a way to soothe themselves. And that's exactly what I was doing. It was a a soothing activity for me. I enjoyed nature. I enjoyed the challenge of the photography. And so that's how I got interested in landscape and photography itself. Okay. And what keeps you going? What is it about landscapes that makes you want to get out in nature? Is it just nature itself and being out there? Or is it the art that's dragging you towards nature? I suppose it's both. I love being out in nature. I live in Northern California in the Central Valley. So the coast is about two hours away for me. The mountains are about two hours away in the other direction. And so there's always that tug to go to the ocean, to photograph, to spend time in nature. And so it's an all-encompassing thing. They feed on each other. Just Mm -hmm. the, the, the nurture of nature 
and the challenge of photography. Yeah. And so what is it in your life? Is it a hobby? Is it a side hustle? Is it a business? <laughs> I guess it's a side hustle. It's actually a part-time business because I do workshops. I do sell prints, yep. that kind of thing. And so when I first started, of course, it was not that at all. It was a hobby. And then people encouraged me and said, oh, you've got to, people should see your work. You need to have a website and that kind of thing. And it just all snowballed from there. So right now it's a very part-time business for me. I, I try not to spend too much time on social media, although it's kind of part and parcel with photography, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's so, hard if you want to sell yourself and your work. Yeah. That's right. It, it's all about exposure. So it's it's that necessary thing. In in terms of where you've looked at your photography, where did it start to become something that was more artistic than recording what you're seeing? A documentary journalistic style tends to be where people, most people anyway, start in their photography. I'm right. interested though where it transitioned for you mm -hmm. into an art form where you said, okay, this is now something that's an artistic pursuit as opposed to a, a journalistic or documentary. Yeah. And sometimes it is still that too, but I think it really started a few years ago when just before the pandemic, I decided I was going to do a 365 and shoot daily. Mm -hmm. And then when the pandemic arrived and I couldn't go anywhere, I thought well, that's, that's it for the 365. I'm not going to be able to keep it up but then I thought no this is a good challenge and so I challenged myself each week like one week I would do double exposures and the next week I would do free lensing and the next week I would use a lens baby and each way each week I just challenged myself to try to be a little more creative and something different and mm -hmm. to push myself a little bit yeah cool so I would say just probably before the pandemic, I started entertaining those thoughts. But then when the pandemic hit, those were like my go-tos to keep it going. And it's something that, is that something that you've continued setting yourself creative challenges beyond where you started doing that 365? From time to time, I do. I, I very much like to document things still as they are. And I'm a pretty mm -hmm. clean editor, but there are times if I'm not really inspired or I, I'm struggling, then I reach into that creative toolkit and try a few things that are a little out of the ordinary for me. Sure, sure, sure. So, and do you have goals in your photography? And do you think it's important for people to have goals in their photography? I do think it's important. I My goal right now is just to keep going and and to keep learning there's so much yeah. to learn and i just i feel like there's always something new to pursue to in whether it's shooting or editing or processing whatever it happens to be so i don't have any definite goals at this point other than just to keep going and keep pursuing cool cool sounds like you using processes of experimentation you talked a little bit about double exposure and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And taking risks with your photography and pushing those boundaries always means that there are going to be times where you don't hit that goal, <laughs> or you don't get what you want. How do you deal with those adverse results and say and, and, and not just throw it all in the air and go, can't do it? Well, yeah. I, I always think I'll try again, but those failures usually land in the trash bin. So <laughs> they don't make the light of day much, but I feel like it's good to experiment because you never know what you might come up with or what might work for you. And, and I've certainly had a lot of failures, that's for sure. Yeah. But, but I never feel like it's a stopping point. When I do fail, I feel like I'll try again, I'll try something different, try it in a different way, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. For me, I've started to take the view that a failure is a learning experience and it enables me to go okay well, that didn't work why didn't it work <laughs> analyze the technical aspects or the pardon me compositional or or artistic aspects and then start to work around okay what can I do to improve that or what can I do to change what I'm doing that will actually give me a different result Exactly. Exactly. I feel the same way. I don't feel like it's, it might be a failure in the moment, 
but it's not a failure down the road. It's a learning experience. And how can I do it differently? And what can I learn from it? Absolutely. One of the things that I've noticed in your work, you do a fairly broad breadth of photography. There's wildlife, there's a little bit Mm -hmm. of architecture and stuff in there as well. What's your favourite type or what's your favourite genre? Or do you not have one and it's just, okay, I'm going (laughs) to do everything? I would say that my favourite genre is landscape. I I also do still life work and, and that's in a separate arena from Mm. on my Instagram and that kind of thing. And a lot of people tell me that my still life work is where my strength is, but my love is really more landscape. And I think part of it is just the getting out, the being in nature, the exploring. So I I would say my favorite genre is landscape. How much of your success in that genre do you attribute to your ability to communicate? Why I use that term communicate in that it's a visual communication medium that we're talking about. And that picture that you're putting together, whether it's compositionally, whether it's the light, et cetera, is telling a story about a particular moment. How do you Mm -hmm. think about pulling those elements together to tell the story that you're trying to tell? Oh my gosh. That's a hard question. I've come to the conclusion that if it really speaks to me, it will speak to someone else. And I try to keep the technicals in line and watch the borders and the compositions and all of that. But I feel like it's in the moment when you view that light or that shadow or that line, whatever it happens to be, if it really jumps out at me, I feel if I capture it the way that I'm seeing it, that will transcend to other people as well, that will speak to them as well. So hopefully it does. And the biggest compliment I can get is for someone to say, oh, I wish I was there right now. That yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And I, I guess for, for me, at least, that's def- a definite component of your style is that naturalistic, here's what this place looks like at this particular time in this particular light. Yeah, yeah. Because right. and But you do feel, okay, drawn into that scene so that you're thinking, okay, it would be marvellous to be there in that light in in that particular moment. Yeah. I've noticed in your work, you are very masterful at achieving beautiful light, beautiful compositions in beautiful light. And I I, I think that's really um, admirable that you are able to do that that to the viewer. It's wonderful. Many times I look at yours and go, oh, I want to be there. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that's my question. Well, again, that's what I'm trying to get across. It, it's that feeling of being somewhere that not many people get to see. I I can go to beaches, and I, I'm talking about urban beaches in Sydney here, which has mm-hmm. you know, got a, a, about 3 million people living in the, <laughs> in the area. And I can sometimes see maybe two, maybe three other people on on this particular beach at the time that I'm there. And so I know that what I'm seeing is a bit special because there's nobody else around to see it. Absolutely. Usually guys rock fishing, there are fishermen out there, or it's uh, swimmers in the uh, the rock pools around Sydney. <laughs> they're, they're normally the people that I bump into in in, yeah. in my travels, but... I guess, so do you ask you, do you like to photograph in the morning or in the evening? I'm on the East Coast, sunrises. You're on the East, okay. Uh, kind of my thing because it's easier. One, the sunsets in Sydney, there's a few places that you can get uh-huh. to that are pretty good for sunset, but they're fewer and further between. It's not that there's right. none, it's just they're fewer and further right. between than I, I can go to any of something like 40-odd beaches within an hour of where I live. And it's, I know as long as the light's going to be there and it's not just a a solid overcast, but even sometimes a solid overcast, those moody shots can be just as as nice. And of course I have the opposites. I'm on the West Coast. So yeah, exactly. So you're a sunset. It's not that great always, just depends. But I do like morning just because there's so few people out. So we're opposite. So I was going to ask with your photography how do you define success in it is it the result of the image is it selling an image is it what is it that you've been successful with 
with your photography? It's mostly if I'm happy with it, if it really speaks to me when I'm finished editing and I'm happy with it. That's my biggest success. Of course, I love it if people like it online or if someone wants to purchase a copy, all of that. But for me, it's that inner feeling like, yes, that is exactly what I was hoping to achieve. That is exactly the mood or the feeling that I wanted. And so I feel that's success. Yeah. Okay. For me. Excellent. In terms of lifestyle, how do you balance work? Are you full-time work or part-time work or how Um, how do you... Very fortunate to not be working. Oh, okay. I used to be an elementary school teacher and I left cool. that a few years ago. And so now I have free time to pretty much photograph whenever I want. My husband and I own a walnut orchard. So sometimes I help with the orchard work, not very much anymore because it's pretty established now. Oh. But I, I have a lot of free time. I'm able to get out, even if it's just to my garden and do some macro work or something like that. I I do have a lot of free time to photograph. So I'm very fortunate in that for sure. And in terms of the website and selling your work and whatever, are you selling prints or NFTs or where is that in you? I don't do NFTs. I I sell prints or or canvases. (laughs) And then from time to time, I will do like an art fair and I'll set up a booth and I'll sell prints and cards and canvases and acrylics or whatever I happen to have there. But mostly it's online or word of mouth. Friends will contact me and request. Nice. Yeah. And what about workshops? Tell us about how you got started in doing those. In what? Workshops. Oh, workshops. I used to take quite a few workshops because I was learning and I just came to the conclusion since I used to be a teacher that I could teach a workshop. And you so should, should have a clue about how to should, put it together. You would think. So I kicked the idea around and my first workshop was a, a, a one day workshop. And I thought that'll be my test to see how it goes. And it really went so well. And at the end of the day, the people that were in the workshop said, this needs to be longer. We're not ready to stop. We want more kind of thing. And so I thought, okay, that's a good sign. And so I went from there. And then I had a friend who wanted to do workshops together. And so we have partnered with a, a couple of locations that we do together. And then as you were mentioned earlier, I do have the waterfalls workshop that I'm doing solo. I do that one on my own. Branching out from there, we're kicking around some ideas and I'm thinking of some different things, but I like doing Northern California and the California coast because that's what I know. I'm familiar with it. Sure. I haven't done a lot of travel as much as I would like to, but I feel like this is what I know. And so I'm, I'm sticking to this. Mm-hmm. And what could somebody expect to uh, experience on one of your workshops? Oh, gosh. Yeah, early early mornings and late evenings, for sure. We go to different locations, the early, late. We'll do pretty much anything they want to do. I, I Like for my waterfall workshop, I have a pretty defined agenda of locations. And then I have several presentations that we do. I have been fortunate enough to reserve an inn. And so we we have the inn to ourselves. And so I do a presentation in their community room. So I have a big screen access and that kind of thing. And so I'll, I do long exposure filters, night photography, shooting and editing, night photography, the waterfalls, a lot of editing, different things. So we have lessons during the day. And then there's free time too. If people want to just browse in this little town where the inn is, they can go out and do macro or street photography or whatever they want to do. Yeah. Variety of things. Sounds wonderful. I think so. Yeah. What do you think is the most important thing to remember when running a workshop first off, but I'm also interested in how you view it from the other side in attending a workshop. Let, let's start with running a workshop. What, what's the most important thing that you could do to somebody that wants to run their oh, own? Workshop? Oh, gosh. There's a lot of ways to answer that, but I would say have it well-planned. Have it well-planned. Go to the sites. Know where you're going to go. 
know what your backup plan is if that site, if that particular location doesn't work. I think planning ahead of time and really having a good backup plan is so important. My number one thing. My number two thing would be to address each workshop member where they are, because some are going to be very beginners and some are going to be pretty yeah. advanced yeah. and it doesn't take too long to figure out who is who and just address them where they are, that kind of thing. And then on the flip side, when I'm attending a workshop, I want the same thing. I want a good plan. I want the workshop leader to know where we're going, what time we need to be there in order to get set up before the light's going to change or whatever it happens to be. And just to be available to me for questions, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, it sounds good. What's the furthest you've traveled to get a shot? Oh, the furthest I've traveled, I think was, and not necessarily to get the shot, but to get a number of shots would be Glacier Bay National Park in Alaska. Yeah. Okay. It's probably the farthest I think I've been. I'd have to look, but I've also shot on the East Coast in Maine. That might be farther than Alaska from here. I'm not sure. Yeah, sure. But uh, anyway, those are my two farthest. Do you have a favorite spot of all the places you've been? Oh, gosh. A favorite spot. I would say just the coast. Anywhere on the coast I love because you've got different lighting. You've got, you might have fog. You might have clouds. You might have full sun. You've got the waves are doing different things. I just feel like it's so diverse that I like the coast pretty yeah. much anywhere. Not. Yeah. California has sea stacks, but then it also has big sandy beaches as well and tide pools. And so there's a good variety. So I would, yeah. I know that doesn't narrow it down much, but I would say that <laughs> the coast. California <laughs> coast is, uh, yeah. <laughs> there's a bit of distance there between the, there the is. North, <laughs> North California and South California. What's the most memorable experience you've had? I think the most memorable was my trip to Glacier Bay National Park in Alaska because I was on board a small, I believe it was built in 1929 boat. It accommodated 10 of us. Wow. Okay. So it was very intimate. We had the captain and the co-captain who was also the cook. And then we had a security person who stayed up overnight to make sure that we didn't have any fires or any emergencies at night. Yeah. And then an instructor, a workshop leader. And then there were six participants. Is that right? Yeah, six participants okay. in this small boat. It was amazing. It was really a trip of a lifetime for me because we were on this small boat. We went into little coves, an area that, of course, big ships can't get into. We saw yeah. tons of wildlife beautiful scenery it was really amazing so I would say it's more than one shot but that would be or trip that would be my favorite trip most memorable nice and I guess yeah. getting there you would have been in some almost pristine wilderness areas as well yes absolutely yeah we had even I think the only time we had internet service was when we went into the national park dock and we walked in toward where the National Park Visitor Center was. We had internet there. But otherwise, we had no internet. We had, really, we didn't, they had stocked the boat before we left. We didn't stop to get food or anything like that. It was wilderness, for sure. We saw bears on the beaches and all kinds of wildlife. Eagles everywhere, of course. Whales. It was really very wild and amazing. Sounds incredible. It was incredible. Very memorable. Do you have any horror stories from photography? I don't. I have one story that has happened to many photographers. Fortunately, I do travel a lot by myself. I've never had any bad incidences or anything like that, I'm happy to say. But the one horror story was when I was first learning photography, I had gone to a, on a workshop in Oregon on the coast. And we were working on the water movement, long exposure yeah. water movement, and we were out in the tide. And I had my tripod and camera set up and was taking pictures and someone spoke to me and I turned away from it and was talking with them. The wave came in, all was fine. But when the wave went out, so did my camera and tripod. Yeah. And fortunately, the person who was talking to me saw it. 
and quickly grabbed it up out of water, but it was drenched. And so I thought, oh gosh, I'm done. I'm The workshop's going to over for me, but right. we dried it off really well and it kept working. Wow. And so when I Good got home, I shipped it off to the camera company to have them check it out. And they sent it back and they said, I told them what happened. They said there was no evidence of water or salt inside the camera wow. or the lens. Wow, was I lucky. Yeah. yeah. But that was like. I've drowned my current camera twice. Oh, have and, you? See, yeah. it happens. And, you know, both, both times I've had to, I've changed the innards because of salt getting oh, into you, them. Oh, yeah. you did. Yeah. Oh. Not fun, but anyway. It <laughs> happens. It happens to everybody and every brand. So yeah. <laughs> you never know. Yeah, yeah. I've lost, like lost the, the lens or two. No, that's as bad as it's been for me. So I count myself very lucky in that regard. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. What's photography taught you about nature? Oh my gosh, how precious it is. So precious. It's taught me that we really need to be serious about taking care of it, taking care of our world. I just have such an elevated appreciation for it now. And part of that could be age. When you're younger, you don't think it's quite as important. Maybe at least I didn't. But yeah, I, I would say just that it's such a precious commodity. We need to really take care of it and coddle it a bit and kind of nurture it back to health. I, I think it's suffering now in a lot of ways. Yeah, I so. think you're right. And I think I think there are ways that photography can actually help get that message across to people. And it's not necessarily <laughs> about showing just the pretty picture or just showing the damage or the, the, the changes. I think seeing changes over time, though, actually can be quite impactful. When you see pictures of glaciers, for example, oh. from five <laughs> years ago compared to today or... 10 years ago or 15 years ago and you That's see right. how far back they've retreated it's just just incredible absolutely and i feel like there are so many people in this world that will not travel will not really know what other continents or other countries or other even other states or providences oh, even, are. even outside their local area some but i know right. people that you know really rarely go more than a, a couple of miles away from where they live. Yeah. Exactly. And yet their actions will impact. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I feel like photography is a way to share with them the beauty of the world and even the ugliness of the damage that we're doing and, and hopefully educate people a little better. As a school teacher, I, I feel like that should be paramount in early education, that we need to take care of where we live. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to touch a little bit on how you work and a little bit about in the field, but also about how, how you go about your, your processing. Do you have a process in the field when you're looking for compositions or looking for a, an image to take? What are you, what are you thinking when you're you're out hmm. there, and how are you feeling about it? I don't usually have any preconceived ideas about areas that I go. And so when I get there, I'm always looking, where's the light? Are there some lines? What is speaking to me? What is drawing me in? I read a book by R. Wolf, I believe it was a few years ago. Yep. And he talked a lot about being there, just being in nature, letting it, soaking it in, letting it speak to you a little bit and observing before you get out your camera and start shooting. And I really try to do that. And I, I just look for things that speak to me. Yeah. That yeah. attract me in some way. And when you get back, are you straight into processing or do you leave things to <laughs> marinate for a bit or? I let it marinate. And yet I used to be one of those people that loaded it downloaded the pictures, immediately went through them, picked out the ones I liked and edited. And I kind of got into that habit uh, early in my photography career. I did three years of a 365. Mm. And so that pushes you to do, to do that, that yeah. every day. Yeah. So when I quit doing those and I was taking longer, bigger trips and being a little more thoughtful about my landscape photography or whatever it happened to be, I would wait, I still wait until I get home for the most part to load them. I'll load them on my computer and back them up on my drive, on my external drive right away. But yeah. I don't necessarily look at them 
and I don't usually edit on the road. I do take my laptop and I will load oh. them onto it as a safety precaution to say yeah. what I've taken. But again, I like to percolate on it a little bit and then revisit the images before I decide what I'm going to edit or what works. What do you think has drawn you to that sort of practice and what do you see is the advantage of doing it that way? When I used to edit right away, I would keep pretty much everything I took for whatever shoot it was. And oh. so when I would go back to visit those shots and look at what I had taken, but not edited, I found gems. I yeah. found really great photographs. And it's like, why didn't I pick this? So <laughs> that kind of taught me maybe I should uh, not be too hasty and deleting and things like that and take some time to separate myself from the emotion of the trip or whatever it happened to be yeah. and then take a look at them after the fact and see what what presented as what seemed good do you prefer photographing alone or with other people Oh my gosh. There are benefits to both. I probably shoot by myself more than with other people. I enjoy having other people around, mm -hmm. but I feel like it takes away my focus sometimes of what I'm doing. And sometimes I just want to be out on a casual shoot with a friend and it's more about socializing and pointing things out to each other and commiserating about the bad light or whatever it happens to be. But other times I just like to be on my own, enjoying nature, that back to that comfort medicinal kind of feeling that nature provides. Yeah, okay. So I, I can go either way, but I guess probably, gosh, I, it's a toss up. Okay. Do you often bump into people that you know out, out in the field? From time to time, yes. And if I don't know them when I bump into them, I know them after I bump into them. <laughs> I like to chat to pe with people on the trail. I find people on the trail are so friendly and everybody's out to enjoy nature. It's just a great time. I, I do enjoy that. Yeah. So I, I, from time to time, do bump into people that I've already met or know. And then, and then when I leave, I, I know them if I don't, yep. if I didn't before. Do you print any of your work? I have a few things printed for myself. Not a lot. Mostly it's requests from other people or if I sell oh, something. Mm -hmm that kind of thing. I've been told I need to print more and I probably do. I've thought about getting a printer and doing my own printing here, but I haven't. One, I of, one of the things I've taken to doing and I do a couple of these every year is a, a bit of a year in review just for my own in, in a book form. So using one of the self-publishing systems there where you can upload all your photos and yes. array them on a page and pay somebody some money to to print it out <laughs> it works because to, to me an image really isn't finished until it's printed i got a yes. lot that aren't printed but that's usually because i haven't got around to making those books and sometimes those books are about if we've gone on a holiday with my wife or something It'll be a mix mm -hmm. of snapshots as well as some of the artistic stuff was in there. But oh, it, I've just found that a really good way of, of sort of getting stuff into print in a format yes. that is, <laughs> and it, it's just personal for me. I'm not trying to sell those books or anything. No, I, I think that's a great way to do it I, because we all only have so much wall space, right? We should, well, this I is it, everything. yeah. And remember photo albums with in the film days. Have you, yeah. I know I've got a, a stack of them in the bookcase here behind me. Yes. And yes. getting them out is an absolute joy and going through and you know, seeing the family 10, 20, mm -hmm. 30 years ago. How many pictures do you put in a book? Couldn't tell you off the top of my head how many pictures, probably anywhere up to two or three hundred. Maybe if I oh. if it's a if it's a holiday inclusive book, then it could be as many as six hundred because I might have five or six smallish snapshotty mm -hmm. on a on a be, it won't be anything up to about a hundred, hundred and twenty okay. pages. Yeah. It it won't be a picture to a page unless it's a particular shot that I'm going, yeah, well, that's gotta be on a page on its own. By itself. Yeah, that's a yeah. good one. <laughs> there are some that the, the, the portfolio shots, they're the ones that stand out. They've got to be on a page on their own. But yeah, you know, there's other right. shots where I can put, say, four on a page and I'm happy with that or two on a page if they're, if they're in portrait orientation. 
Oh gosh, you're inspiring me. I might just have to do that. Oh, awesome. I, do that. I just get a lot of joy out of flicking through them. You go back oh, to some of the ones that I made five, 10 years ago and, and flick through mm -hmm. and go, wow, really messed up the focus on that one. You know? We're so critical of ourselves, aren't we? Yeah. It's not, it's not that bad. I don't put out of focus <laughs> shots in there too often. <laughs> Speaking about things that get in the way, have you ever hit a creative wall or a, a period where you've just been blocked and you can't do photography? What yes. do you do about oh, that? And what gosh. have you done in the past that's got you yeah. around? I had a time a couple of years ago where I just was not inspired to pick up my camera. And in fact, it went on for a few weeks i started to get worried about myself because i thought gosh wow. if i don't pick up my camera again what will i do kind of thing but i found that uh, i just let myself be uninspired for a while and then i thought one day okay i i need to just go and shoot do something yeah. so I grabbed my gear and i took off went to a park not too far away and just started snapping away and before I knew it, then it was like, okay, yeah, I, I need to get back into this. I'm, I'm ready now. But I think when I hit those slumps and I've had others, not as bad as that one, I'll go to an art museum and look at paintings or sculptures or yep. things that are artistic in a different way than photography is, or even music and just try to separate myself from the photography and let it be what it is mm. and look at other creative sources and then eventually make my way back to it. Yeah. I try to have a bit of a think about why I'm feeling that way and recognize first off, it's a part of those psychology techniques that you use to, to, to work through stuff and just acknowledge it, recognize it, try and analyze why, it, why that feeling is there and mm -hmm. then start to look at, okay, what alternatives have I got? What are the other things that I can be doing that will right. get me back on the road and back into into mm -hmm. producing work again? And that seems to work for me. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I When I was in one of those slumps one time, I was talking with a friend and he goes, I have a friend out on the West Coast who's doing a workshop next week and I think there's space. Why don't you take that workshop? I think you'd really like it and I think nice. it'll get you out of your slump. And I thought, okay, I will. And I did, and it did, and that was great. Sometimes it's just a matter of forcing yourself to pick up the camera and go out after you've had some time away. I, yeah. I'm not sure exactly what the answer is. I think it's probably different each time. That said, taking a break is a, a good idea as well than just spending some time doing other things because you know, life, yeah. life can't be all about doing photography all of the time. <laughs> so I've been told. <laughs> yeah, I've, I, I get told that quite a bit. <laughs> particularly Every vacation if doesn't have to be a photography Yeah, particularly shoot. when we're, we're uh, planning vacations somewhere and it's this isn't all about photography. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to go there yeah. and I want to go there. <laughs> I've heard those same be... words, Grant. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to be there for sunrise what <laughs> said or whatever. Yeah. How do you deal with those conversations? I'd, I'd like some tips. <laughs> I feel my spouse is pretty tolerant of my camera most of the time. Oh, so if, yeah. if, if he says something, then I know I need to back off a little bit. And then we'll compromise on it. But it was, I have to tell you the story. We were going away to Yosemite for our anniversary and our anniversary happens to be in February, which is when firefall occurs. Yeah. And as we were packing up to go, I was saying something about firefall. And my husband said, every trip doesn't have to be about photography. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that sounds a familiar. <laughs> but fortunately he does enjoy taking pictures too. So we both oh. took our cameras when we pulled into the park and cars were lined up because I what can imagine was, yeah, it would be, it was a few years ago before they really were controlling it much. And he said, yeah. what is going on? I said, it's firefall. And he goes, we probably should go look. We probably should go. And I said, yeah, we should. And so we ended up taking our gear and we got fabulous shots and he was thrilled and wanted to go out the next evening and shoot it again. So awesome. there you go. I guess that's one way of doing it. Get, get the spouse into photography. You never know. Yeah. I must admit, my wife does come out some mornings at stupid uh -huh. clock and we go out and she, she goes for a walk along the beach and we then meet up at the end and have some breakfast beside yeah. the sea and you know it turns out to be a nice 
way of reconnecting as well. Yeah, that's a good compromise. Yeah. That's a great way to do it. What do you see as the biggest challenge facing photography right now? I would say, gosh, there's a couple, but I would say probably AI is a big one. I I feel like as AI gets better and better, the need for photographers might decline. Right now, I feel like I can pretty much spot an AI shot. Mostly, easy. yes. Yeah. I'm, Still, I'm but I, I'm afraid that down the road, we won't be able to as well. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I certainly hope that AI can never match the creativity and the soul that is put into an image that a photographer makes. Yeah. So I would say AI is probably looming out there as the threat. Mm. Yeah, I I disagree. The, there's a lot of challenges there. I, I still don't see it as being a big enough challenge to, to landscape photography. I'm, probably the biggest challenge at the moment some of the accounts on Instagram and Meta and X and all the rest of it that are pushing that sort of art, for want of a better term, because yeah. it's not photography, but pushing that as photography to lay people that don't recognise that it isn't really photography right. and profiting off that's mm -hmm. a challenge where they're being dishonest and right. not being transparent about the fact, hey, this is AI generated. You know, there are some accounts out there that are totally honest and are saying, mm -hmm. I'm doing this as AI generation. You know, it's fine to each their own. But if, right. if you're making money out of it by saying this is photography when it's not, that's when it grinds my gears. Yes, absolutely. I felt the same way when people over-process their photography is it photography or is it digital art you know yeah the, the lines are blurred or are you a photographer to me there's a difference there but there's room for everything but say what it is be honest yeah. about what it is yeah. i think that's an important message to get across to people is that if you're going to do digital art call it digital art or it could still be composite photography because you've taken all right. of those images and composited them and so forth it's mm -hmm. totally a valid art form don't say hey i stood here and took this single shot and isn't right. it amazing what it is yeah yeah say, say what it is say that it's a composite or, yeah. or you've actually and, and to me explaining some of how you've done some of those things not in nitty-gritty detail but talking about hey, I've done this, it's a composite, I took a blue hour shot and I put a, a Milky Way over the top of it because I shot them from the same position but at a different time. Totally valid. That's still photography, but you've also got to be honest about how you've pulled that together. Exactly. I feel the same, yeah. Where do you see the future of photography going? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I, I don't know, really. I think it's such a, a wonderful hobby for people so i hope it always stays that for sure but more sophisticated photography i don't know I, I hope that people recognize the value the authenticity of a, a photograph and yeah. continue to honor that and it's hard to say what will happen but certainly hope it continues yeah yeah i don't think it'll stop painting didn't stop when photography came along the yeah and the art form and as you said getting out into nature and recording what you're seeing is just a, mm -hmm. a, a bigger part of it as the end result and sharing it so for me I don't see that ever stopping for me it's something that mm -hmm. I'll I'll always do until I can't absolutely I, I totally agree with you on that yeah I'm not sure about commercial photographers or yeah I think um, there's definitely commercial photographers that are going to be very much impacted we're already seeing fashion photographers and product photographers mm. being supplanted a bit by ai mm -hmm. because marketing departments can do that for right. virtually no money compared to what it used to cost them to produce yeah you know. exactly yeah yeah it'll be interesting to see how it goes hopefully yeah. not fast <laughs> no what's your favorite thing about being a photographer oh my gosh probably what we've talked about before just I love the creativity. I like the independence of it. I like the calming effect it has on me. I like the nature. I just kind of like it all. 
Yeah. Except for editing. Nice. Editing is not my favorite. We didn't <laughs> talk rest. much about editing earlier. I, I guess I, I should touch on that. What what do you do when you're editing? What What's your process look like? I, I use primarily Lightroom. I do yep. take some things into Photoshop if I need to do something a little more elegant with it. But mostly I just do a real basic edit in Lightroom. I'll adjust the colors if I need to adjust the white balance, that kind of yep. thing. A little bit of contrast, maybe a little bit of this and that. I, I, I'm a very minimal editor for the most part. If a sky, if I didn't capture a sky as richly as what I saw it in order to keep the foreground light enough, then I'll, I'll darken the sky. I'll yeah. pop some, try to tease some color out of it a little bit. If it's there, it, it just needs to come out. So that yeah. kind of thing. I don't do a lot of editing. Photoshop, uh, if I want to extend the canvas, I am a notorious tight shooter. So if I want to print something on the canvas and have it wrap, I don't have I don't have enough room. So I've got to extend the print canvas in Photoshop in order to wrap it a canvas. So that kind of thing. But mostly it's pretty clean edit. Yeah, nice. I'm doing a creative edit, like with my florals or still life then yeah. I'll, I'll do more creative color and things like that but yeah. actually, i'm a pretty clean editor nice what's the worst thing about being a photographer business wise it's all the business but since i'm part-time i can't complain about that too much but that's why i backed off a little bit i used to be more full-time and it, i just i was spending way too much time on the administrative stuff did not care for that at all Worst part about being a photographer is probably the temptation to get new gear <laughs> and I don't really need it. It's always attractive to have some new toy. I don't know. I'm not sure what the worst part is. It, it's all pretty good. And what do you like to do when you're not out shooting? I put her around in my garden quite a bit. I have a floral garden, a flower garden, cutting garden, and also a, a vegetable garden. And so this time of year for me, it's summer, end of summer. For you, it's like end of winter, isn't it? Yeah, it's so, feeling very summery though today, 25 degrees. Oh, is degrees. it? Yeah. Good. So I'll work on my garden a bit. I'll walk. I'll ride my bike. Usually outside if I can be, unless I have something I need to do in the house. But mostly that, out and about. Nice. Coffee with friends, maybe. <laughs> cool. What's the best and or worst piece of advice anyone's ever given you? The best or worst advice? Yeah. The best advice was probably not to compare myself to other photographers because everybody's at a different, we're all on our own journey. We're all at a different place. And so it's better not to compare your work and get discouraged when you compare yourself with somebody who's more accomplished, been at it longer or whatever. So that's probably the best advice. First advice, boy, that's a hard one. I don't know. I, I don't know what the worst advice is that I've ever gotten. That's okay. I'll have to think about that one, though. No problem. Are there any photographers that you think I need to be talking to on the podcast? Oh, I'm sure. And I look through your the list of people that you've already talked to. So many of the people I would recommend you've already talked to. But I wrote down a couple of names here. One is Lewis Kemper. He's a photographer in California and also Florida. He's a career photographer. He's been uh, a photographer for over 40 years. And so I, I think you might enjoy talking with him. And Erwin Busk, he's yep. from, you're familiar with Erwin? He's from the Seattle area, I think. And then Jennifer Carr. Okay. She lives in the Seattle area and also in Virginia. So she's by coastal and she's a wonderful landscape photographer has workshops and different things so Brilliant. i think you enjoy her thank you for that sure i've got one more question and it's something i'm been trying to get to the bottom of for a lot of photographers Do you like pineapple <laughs> on pizza <laughs> <laughs> so I, I i was talking when you were talking i just clarify for me what the question is do you like pineapple on pizza? Yeah, that's what I thought it was. Actually, I do. I do like pineapple on pizza, as long as it's got the Canadian bacon to go with it and lots of cheese. It's been wonderful talking to you today, Nadine. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Where can people find your work? I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I have a website, nadineflynn.com, and that's N-A-D-E. 
E N Flynn, F L Y N dot com. I'm also on Instagram under Nadine Flynn, also on Facebook under Nadine Flynn Photography, and that's about it. Fair enough. I'm, I'm on Threads and Flickr, but I I don't really post there much, so those yeah, those aren't good. vital. Oh, right, thank you once again. It's been uh, really good to get to meet you and uh, learn more about you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And I'll be watching for more of your work on Instagram. Brilliant. Thanks, Nadine. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at gruntswinburnphotography.com along with prints and my calendars and photography gear. I'm also on Vero, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon. Mm -hmm.